Join me, Mark Windows, for Windows on the World Live every Sunday, 9 to 11 p.m. GMT. Check out our archive and program stream at windowsontheworld.net. Welcome to Windows on the World. Yes, tonight we are the victims for a change. We're going to claim honorary victim status and we're going to look at the absurdity of the people claiming victim status in the post-truth world. I would suggest that all listeners to Windows on the World unite. Victims of the world unite. Yes, I'm being trivial about it, but there is a very serious side to this and we're going to go into that and we're going to give some great examples of what's going on in British politics and beyond. Now, we're in the post-truth world where evidence of hate is not required in reporting hate crime. Well, we all hate crime, but we are now the victims and have no recourse. Meanwhile, Meanwhile, whinging MPs with subversive agendas against the best interests of the country are able to use hearsay or fake claims of anti-Semitism and hate and the other extremely tedious, trivial things that are going on which does not have anything to do with basics, with actually anything that is really happening. The post-truth world and the post-fact world don't need any of this stuff where the selected lobbyists for outside and third-party interests rule over the bought and paid for repeaters and these spineless creatures who inhabit the cesspit of public life and public office. So that's a good way to describe what we're going to be talking about. Now let's get into this with some examples. For instance, the pathetic Tom Watson, deputy leader of the Labour Party, acquiescing to the now tedious claims of unproven and misrepresented anti-Semitism, the most misused and abused term of the last several years. Now, the sycophantic parasites towing the line do so at the expense of those that they claim that they represent. That's the important thing. These are public servants openly subverting our politics and the opinions of the public for third-party interests who they are absolutely succumbing to. So, basically, the sycophantic parasites towing the line, doing this at the expense of everybody they represent. Nothing of importance is covered by the rolling news channels. There's nothing on there, and anything of importance is subverted or airbrushed over. That's an aside, but a very important one. It might be time to name and shame all these parasite MPs and public servants who serve themselves and the lobbyists subverting against the interests of everyone except the dumbed-down elite who pull their strings. And yes, the elite are dumbed down, the so-called elite, not the real elite, of course. We're talking about these urban elite, these people who are actually um, implementing a lot of these policies and strategies from above. Now, ridiculing the parasites in public office should become a necessary part of letting these idiots know who is in charge. Yes, it's us. They will, of course, scream about their honorary victim status, which I am removing as exposing these reprehensible creatures is now a public interest issue. Okay, so maybe we can bring some clarity and truth when talking about these subversives and these terminally stupid mental midgets and devious but thick enemies of anything useful. Because most of these people are terminally stupid when it comes down to it, but they're just very devious and self-serving. So let's start with, um, yes, let's start with a good example of this. The UK's most ridiculous MP this week, David Lammy, MP for Tottenham. He's just made a statement which has been in the newspapers. Donald Trump is a racist KKK and Nazi sympathiser, says David Lammy. This self-serving clown never focuses on issues which he can be called to account for. That's extremely important with these virtue signalling narcissists, namely those of his constituents. He doesn't really look after them, as far as I can tell. In fact, I have proof that he doesn't from my own experience. However, if there's anyone out there who's got anything good to say about him, and your name's not Chucker Ramona, <laughs> please write into the show. <laughs> this overprivileged, ego-driven narcissist never fails to virtue signal. He puts himself in the spotlight. And his latest plan is to chain himself. Get this. This is David Lammy's latest plan to chain himself to the door of number 10 if Trump's visit goes ahead. Well, I think that would be rather a comedic moment and a moment 
which a lot of people would turn up for, and probably not for the reasons that he thinks. So, this must have been learned, I think, from the tactics of Extinction Rebellion, who've been gluing themselves to doors, lying in the road, in an effort to change the uh, climate before the world ends in 12 years' time. It's on about the same kind of level. Maybe he's had lessons from them. He's on the same mental level as Extinction Rebellion, in my opinion. So, meanwhile, gangs in his constituency shoot and hack each other to death with such regularity that the media features murders on a daily basis in London. And I wonder if he's ever going to address that issue. And let's move on to the next segment. Yes, <laughs> the spineless, groveling deputy leader of the Labour Party, Tom Watson, has been rebuked by Labour General Secretary Jenny, Jenny Formby after Watson asked Labour parliamentarians to forward complaints made to the party about anti-Semitism to him so that they could be monitored by him. <laughs> This is unreal. Formby said it is completely unacceptable to receive data relating to such complaints. So in other words, he wants to get his hands on it all before it goes through proper procedures within the Labour Party. But this Tom Watson, I mean, is grovelling and his virtue signalling, his sycophancy. I would say, yes, he is pretty much top of the list this week in that respect as a grovelling parasite in public office. Now, with the suspension of this Chris Williams, Mark Wadsworth, Jackie Walker, many, many more others, the Labour Friends of Stasi of Israel have created an intolerant, discriminatory and totalitarian regime for their own interested parties. That's a fact. But Hackney North and Stoke Newington constituency Labour Party hit out at the claims of anti-Semitism spread by the media and the right wing of the Parliamentary Labour Party they said it is unacceptable to allow our representatives to slander the party and its members whilst we put them into office, their motion stated. Well, that sounds fairly sensible, doesn't it? You don't actually have a go at people when they are serving in office and you put them there. Fair, fair point. So let's now get on to another complete idiot. Walthamstow selfie-loving, trivia-talking, virtue-signalling MP Stella Creasy said the motion was disgraceful and called on Labour's General Secretary to investigate for the sake of all. Well, would that be the sake of the lobbyists she grovels to, along with all the other spineless jellyfish who were basically subverting public office against the interest of their constituents? I keep reiterating this point because it's important. Now this Stella Creasy, when I lived in Walthamstow, I reported to her that a phone mask that had been turned down by public debate and an official notice was put on where this mast was going to be actually um, built, stated that it had been turned down. Within a couple of months it was there. We're in an area of nine schools. She wasn't concerned about that though because it had nothing to do with mentioning herself or her persecution or something that's trendy in the news that's being put there by the lobbyists you see this is where they all fall down they fall down on the real issues which they're elected for which is actually to represent the people who voted for them so are they selected or elected well let's just have a think about that because as the show goes on we may throw some light on few more of these people and whether they were actually selected or elected because when we talk about the actual voting systems that these people are put into power by we have to question them as well and we've also got something on those who do question all this stuff they're called conspiracy theorists by the mainstream media or investigative journalists by everybody else with a brain cell however next let's go on to publicity victim Luciana Berger um, she even made a video starting with being Jewish. That was the first word she said. And that she had six people convicted of anti-Semitic hate crimes and death threats. So uh, one of them's gone to prison, I think. Uh, that was a long time ago. And I think that was someone who was a bit of an extremist. However, that she's saying that she's really sorry she's had to put these people in prison or get them basically accused of these crimes. Now, the thing is that when I've been abused on Twitter and had 
out of misinformation spread about me on the internet. I've had no recourse whatsoever. And I would suggest to Luciana Berger that people are going through much worse things than this on a daily basis. The abuse of people who are actually trying to do something useful in this country and getting basically shut down and having everything taken off them is a lot more serious than tweets and Twitter and all this internet stuff, which really is not what I would call abuse. I mean, abuse is something different, and anyone who suffered abuse would probably say the same thing. Now, this is all on social media, when the abuse given by those who are purporting to be victims to those who question anything will not raise an eyebrow. So those who are purporting to be victims, um, they are the people who are in the press, and those who question anything will not raise an eyebrow. It's a very, very important point, I think, that one. She then goes on to blame the EU referendum, does Luciana Berger, for a rise in anti-Semitism. Total subversion, that's not true. They tried that with the Joe Cox murder. They tried to call anyone who wants to leave the EU far right. That's an underhand, dirty tactic, by the way. And that's what we expect from people in public office, unfortunately. She then goes on to say it would be very easy for her to put her head in the sand and block her ears and pretend there wasn't a problem. Well, if there really is a problem, let's get down to it. But the evidence so far doesn't say that there's a huge problem here. There's problem in lots of other areas. And Corbyn really needs to clean his nest out, in my opinion, because he's now letting people like Watson walk all over him very bad move. I think he should do something about it if he's going to redeem himself. That's a side issue. Maybe he will, maybe he won't. So the barefaced cheek of the likes of this subversive MP and all the people we've talked about is hard to take. So tonight we're going to look further into the hate speak agenda with some fine examples and evidence of the subversion of everything and anyone who has a moderate viewpoint or indeed a sensible approach. Now remember that anyone with a sensible approach is now deemed to be an extremist. Anyone who's moderate is deemed to be far right. How strange is that? Let's go over the pond first and talk about an organisation called the Southern Poverty Law Centre. And there's a report that states that it buried Trump-related hate crimes against white kids by... This is by a guy called Paul Sperry. Now, just give you a a bit of a background on the Southern Poverty Law Centre. It sounds great, doesn't it? Helping all those poor people. It's nothing of the sort. It's basically a lobbying group for the Anti-Defamation League in America. And they go around defaming people who are moderate or people who may, maybe they support Trump, anyone who's outside this accepted extreme leftist ideology, which is being imposed on all of us. So it was founded in 1971 and it claims to be a non-partisan civil rights law group, but it receives funding from leftist groups, including ones controlled by the billionaire philanthropist George Soros. Oh, I've just done something anti-Semitic. I've mentioned George Soros. Well, George Soros is anti-Semitic, isn't he? Look him up. George Soros is definitely anti-Semitic. It says, Review of Federal Election Commission records reveals that its board members have contributed more than $13,400 to Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign. It's a side issue, really, with the money that they get and the money that they spend on actually defaming people. Former Education Department civil rights attorney Hans Bader pointed out that most of the anti-minority hate crimes and hate incidents cited by SPLC do not legally constitute hate crimes. In other words, it's slander, really, that they're doing, and many involve constitutionally protected speech. It is simply ridiculous that SPLC treats build the wall as hate rhetoric, he said. So anyone who says build the wall um, is indulging in hate speak. He said the centre counted people mentioning build the wall as 467 incidents of hate. Now, I would suggest that that goes on in this country. We have this kind of, it's a, it's a kind of um, cheap version um, in the respect that they don't get as much money of the Southern Poverty Law Centre, Hope Not Hate, have been in the news recently. We've covered them a lot. Look at our investigations into Hope Not Hate, how they're funded, what they do, and what they're about. They're a subversive organisation, but the SPLC has $432.7 million 
to persecute anybody who speaks against the interests. Now, hope not hate are what they would call a pound shop version of that because they were trying to get the public to pay for them to sue Nigel Farage. I don't know how that works, but that's what they were trying to do. At the end of the fiscal year, it says, the SPLC, in our endowment, a special board designated fund established to support our future work, in other words, defamation, stood at 432.7 million. We're proud of the stewardship of our resources, it says. Now, the Southern Poverty Law Centre omits 2,000 post-election anti-white hate crimes from this report. Many media outlets, including university student newspapers, have touted the Southern Poverty Law Centre's report on the alleged writing rise in hate crimes since the election of Donald Trump. According to this report, some 4,000 educators claim to have heard derogatory language directed at students of colour, Muslims, immigrants and people based on gender or sexual orientation. However, Paul Sperry of the New York Post points out that the SPLC failed to mention 2,000 instances of educators reporting anti-white hate incidents, presumably of an anti-Trump nature, it says here. But the centre had also asked in its questionnaire to agree or disagree with the statement. Get this. I have heard derogatory language or slurs about white students, but they didn't include that in the results. How subversive can you get? What a surprise. However, a really interesting book has appeared on Amazon. You don't have to buy it on Amazon. I'm sure it's available on other worthy outlets. It's by a guy called Wilfred Riley, and it's called Hate Crime Hoax, How the Left is Selling a Fake Race War. And he carries on in his presse of this book, his write-up. If you believe the news, today's America is plagued by an epidemic of violent hate crimes. But is this really true? In Hate Crime Hoax, Professor Wilfred Riley examines over 100 widely publicised incidents of so-called hate crimes that never actually happened. With a critical eye and attention to detail, Riley debunks these fabricated incidents, many of them alleged to have happened on college campuses, and explores why so many Americans are driven to fake hate crimes. We're not experiencing an epidemic of hate crimes, Riley concludes, but we might be experiencing an unprecedented epidemic of hate crime hoaxes. Now, think about what's happening all over France and think about what's being talked about. This is a really interesting point and I would definitely recommend that book. In fact, I'll probably read it myself. So this is from charleshughsmith.blogspot.com. He's come to my attention recently, mainly through Per in Sweden who's a journalist who sends us in quite a lot of stuff every week. And along with other people, it really helps when people do this because other people send in stuff, sometimes not on such a regular basis, but it's really important because it helps me get the bigger picture to put out there that a lot of this stuff is interrelated. That's the whole point of it. When you hear the same stories from all different sources of things that are happening, then you know that this is not isolated. You know that this is endemic. In other words, it's part of an agenda. However, in Charles Smith's blog spot, he says, in terms of signalling one's loyalty and fervour, extremism pays dividends within the tribe, while being reasonable will get you shunned or ejected. Isn't that just true? Isn't that absolutely true? The quiet voice of reason is drowned out by the hysterical rage of the terminally uninformed. It carries on. Just about the only thing the virulent proponents of various extremes can agree on is that anyone attempting to be reasonable is a mortal threat that must be neutralised or destroyed. Now, this is dating back to the era of Benjamin Franklin. A willingness to hear another point of view and another set of solutions, i.e. being reasonable, was the hallmark of political progress. The corrosive incivility of the online digital world has been normalised to such a degree that it has infiltrated the real world. That's a great point, actually, because you get this all the time, don't you? These hysterical, screaming people who just hurl abuse. And it's basically what they're used to doing on social media, but they're doing it in real life now. Very good point. People now feel they have the right to heap abuse and scorn on those outside their tribe in the real world as they do online and fabricate completely staged hate crimes to justify their demonization of competing tribes. Righteous indignation is now viewed as a free pass to act with appalling incivility and relentlessly demonize anyone expressing skepticism of your tribe's virtue signal. 
building, promoting a differing set of values and solutions, or indeed being reasonable in an increasingly unreasonable era. Now, I always like to think that we're quite reasonable. I do have a little bit of a go at things now and again, but I always do it from the point of view which I think is pretty fair. In other words, redressing the balance or indeed balancing the books. I think that's what this show's about sometimes, balancing the books. It carries on though here as reasonable people are drowned out in a rising sea of simplistic orthodoxies. Oh yeah, we know all about that. Yeah, Trump's a Nazi. Climate change is real. Well, we know it's real, but the CO2 scam is real. That's what they mean. And basically, anyone who votes Brexit is a Nazi. Those are simplistic orthodoxies that will get you shouted at by the hysterical lunatics who've been brainwashed by the Stasi and, of course, the education system. It says perverse incentives to become ever more extreme and rigid are happening. The, the system that depends on reasonable compromise and mutual acceptance comes apart. Um, now, that's that's really good, that. And Pers added something here, Per from Sweden, who supplied that. That's the new totalitarian mindset in a nutshell. Once the lunatics have taken over the asylum, they institute between them a power-sharing agreement which defines their own lunacy as the new normal and then proceeds to stamp out the old normal through cultural Marxist norm critique. That's in inverted commas. However, let's move on now to... France and President Macron floated the idea at the annual dinner of the Representative Council of Jewish Institutions in France, the CRIR, saying that a new bill to fight against hate speech online was being tabled for May this year, the broadcaster BFM TV reported. The proposal to stifle speech online comes as President Macron faces unprecedented levels of criticism from the anti-government Yellow Vest movement. The French state's cracked down hard on Yellow Vest activists. Well, we know that. Anyone who watches those streams on Saturdays will actually find that out. Isn't it strange? This has been going on for well over three months, so it's almost like your Saturday viewing. It's taken over. Do you remember Grandstand when they had six hours of football and sport on every day? It's taken over from that now. It's like six hours of protest instead. Fantastic. It says arresting 8,400 protesters in just a matter of months. While Macron and other globalist politicians have pushed for ever-increasing laws and regulations to combat hate speech, inverted commas, and so-called fake news, inverted commas, online, the new proposal would mark a significant shift to the current punishments of fines and prison sentences. That's where Macron wants to do. That's where it's going. I don't think that this is going to do him any good because he's, the more he digs a hole for himself, the deeper it gets and the more chance there is of him falling into it. Now, this is from Karen Shek Nazarov. And she says, it's your turn now, EU. The EU is headed towards complete Soviet-style collapse. And that's what's happening in Europe. It's, to my mind, she says, an objective process. That's why Europe's confused. There's one thing Europe wants to leave everything the way it was in the 90s. That's a really interesting point, isn't it? Because it all seemed to go on quite benignly then behind the scenes. But that's not going to happen anymore because everything's got more draconian. We've got replacement migration. We've got the destruction of sovereignty. We've got absolute chaos being enforced on countries, looting beyond anyone's imagination. Now that um, the not entirely sober Claude Juncker has decided to follow the instructions of a 15-year-old with Asperger's and say that he's going to put one in four of every euros to climate change mitigation. Mitigation is where the money is. That's where the green lobby make their fortunes. So he's obviously doing the right thing for his masters, but not for the rest of the population. However, what she says is, is believe it or not, or like it or not, Europe will have tough times. Now, this is quite interesting. There's um, a YouTube video called Evrosoyuz, E-V-R-O-S-O-Y-U-S, and that relates to what Karen Shekhanasov is saying there, and it's well worth a watch. Let's move quickly on. Jewish group may split from Labour, 
amid growing row over anti-Semitism. Now, this is Peter Mason, who's the National Secretary of the Jewish Labour Movement, says members are considering whether to end a 99-year affiliation with the Labour Party. Peter Mason is the National Secretary of the Jewish Labour Movement, and he told Sky News the group is looking at ending its 99-year affiliation with the party over lack of action. Well, it's been a lack of action. Yeah, they, they haven't kicked out all the subversives. That's all been Corbyn's fault. He should have actually acted and got rid of these people. However, it carries on. The row has intensified in the last few days over comments made by MP Chris Williamson. Now, Chris Williamson is an absolutely down-to-earth, real person, sensible bloke. He's made some brilliant, brilliant points on every single news item that I've seen him on. And he's now been kicked out of the Labour Party. He's been suspended by the party. So he's going to have to grovel to them, basically. And this is the problem, that people are being made to grovel. And he's, this is what's been said. Um, Mr Williamson said the party had been too apologetic about anti-Semitism. And his view has since been backed by Shadow Home Secretary Diane Abbott's Constituency Association. Well, what's wrong with that? They have been too apologetic because what you need to do is find out whether this is actually real or whether it's been used by lobbyists to subvert what's going on in a political party. And anyone who watches the lobby or any of these reports, the Al Jazeera documentary, the Israel lobby, there was a Channel 4 show on. I mean, how can you hide this stuff? How can you pretend that it's not there? It's, it's absolutely unreal and it is the post-truth world. It says here, there have been claims that if the row is not brought under control, it could irrevocably damage the party. Days after seven Labour MPs quit, which with many citing the failure of the party to tackle anti-Semitism as their motivation. Well, I don't think that was their motivation. Their motivation was to get rid of Corbyn. And what they've done now is they've set up a Blairite party, which is going to get loads and loads of publicity on the mainstream media because they all want this kind of nonsense party that's run by lobbyists and absolutely subversive in power so in my opinion jeremy corbyn it's now or never as the song goes however let's move on this was about um dr maruf ali's a computer science lecturer and he's been suspended by this university of essex and what happened there is that a number of students, 200 students, had voted against the creation of a society for Jewish students. It was an online thing and it quickly got pulled, apparently. But basically, what they've done now is they've actually brought this into the public domain so much that, of course, there's a huge community behind this new organisation. It says the vote held on the Student Union website was cancelled while still underway. So, in other words, it was get they were getting slated and... They, they were obviously equating the, this with uh, what's happening in Israel and all the rest of the stuff that we're not allowed to do. So they've now suspended this computer science lecturer who worked at Essex University um, for allegedly, allegedly anti-Semitic material. Now, I saw this, I think it was one of the Jewish newspapers, and basically they were doing the usual and calling him the names that usually people get called who stand up for Palestine or basically have a go at Israel and so he's now been suspended another victim so he's another victim and he can claim honorary victim status along with the rest of us now can't he now this is an amazing article amazing in that it is unbelievable that anyone paid for it to be produced with no actual evidence presented apart from basically aligning a few things together joining them onto each other and coming up with an assumption. It's from the Daily Mail. Conspiracy theorists are more likely to be criminals and to approve of other forms of antisocial behaviour study reveals for the first time. Well, the reason it's revealed it for the first time is no one would have had the bare-faced cheek to put out nonsense like this years ago. They just would not have got away with it. And it revolves around this idea that people who get actually turned on to things that are big then ignore smaller things, which would make sense, really, wouldn't it? So that's actually the crux of it. If you were actually looking at it from a psychological point of view, you would say that people who find out about the bigger picture, what uh, conspiracy theorists, also known as investigative journalists and people with a brain cell, who don't actually follow a mainstream constructed narrative, um, are more likely to accept maybe petty crime 
as trivial. Yes, they would, because it is trivial. <laughs> what a bunch of Muppets these people are. Anyway, let's get into it. It says, believers in conspiracy theories are more likely to find petty crime acceptable. A new study by psychologists from universities of Kent and Staffordshire. Uh, when you say psychologists from universities of Kent and Staffordshire, you mean basically people who are in institutions with very little to do, who've read a load of manuals and stuff about psychology, and they're finding things to sound clever about. It says, subscribers are more inclined to be involved in antisocial and unethical acts. So what they've done, they've stretched it from this idea that people who actually see the bigger picture, see other things as trivia, to actually labelling them as criminals. That's actually what this article is about. Um, yeah, it says, belief in such ideas, like the theory that Princess Diana was murdered by the British establishment. Well, uh, as I said before, the chances of a, of a not being murdered by the British establishment is pretty slim, really, because the British establishment is hundreds of thousands of people who work within the British so-called establishment. Now, people within the British establishment certainly knew what went on with the death of Diana, and anyone who's got a brain cell, which is not these people, obviously, because they've never done a second's research into it and only followed the, a narrative from Sky News, then anybody who'd actually looked into it would find out that, indeed, there was a conspiracy. And the evidence is all there. You can see the film that was made, that was banned, that, about the death of Diana, which was by Keith Allen, um, you can look that one up. Uh, it was banned in this country, but not Southern Ireland. And there's several other really good films on it. And all you have to do is look at the evidence that was given by people in France and look at the evidence of what happened. And the, the destruction of the crime scene was just even a minor part of it. But this is incredible. However, let's not go on about that. But yes, it says, this. let's carry on to see what they say what these petty actions would be. A second study showed that those who were exposed to conspiracy... See, you get exposed to conspiracy theories. It's like being radicalised, you see. So if you've got a brain cell or two of your own left after you've gone through the education system, then you're basically being exposed to conspiracy theories. So what they could do is call in the prevent strategy team, get you to sit in front of your local council and your local community police and get them to give you some advice on how you could deprogram yourself from these false beliefs. Maybe you could go and work for NSL and become a traffic warden, and then you would know about organised crime rather than petty crime, you know. So during the experiment, they were immediately more accepting of low-level crime. Well, low-level crime, again, it, they, they see what they're going to do in a minute, as you'll find out, is they're going to twist it. But let's see which Muppets are responsible for this psychological waffle garbage, self-indulgent rubbish which they got paid for. Professor Karen Douglas of Kent School of Psychology said, People who believe in conspiracy theories, such as the theory that Princess Diana was murdered by the British establishment, are more likely to accept or engage in everyday criminal activity. Now, can you see how that's been subverted? What they were actually saying was that they would accept petty crime as being trivial. That's actually what they were saying. And that, in other words, because they'd looked into conspiracy theories, they'd seen a bigger picture. But what she's done is turn it into the petty, bitchy, vile subversion of the change agent. That's what she's done. What's her name? Karen Douglas. Maybe she should get an email from people who listen to the show and... Um, maybe they could tell her about a few so-called conspiracy theories, which are actually investigations. Um, and so it says, our research, yes, that says that they um, has shown for the first time, it's shown for the first time because nobody would come up with crap like this. So the reason it's for the first time um, is that nobody would have thought of doing anything so dumb and subversive as this. It says, our research has shown for the first time the role that conspiracy theories can play in determining an individual's attitude to everyday crime. It demonstrates that people subscribing to the view that others have conspired might be more inclined towards unethical actions. Well, again, that's subversion, because what that means is that once you see conspiracies, and you see conspiracies within organisations then your actions would be deemed unethical by these people who are in charge because you're pointing out their subversive actions. 
So this is all back to front, load of nonsense. Um, the other Muppet who wrote it is Dr. Dan Jolly of Staffordshire University. And he said, people believing in conspiracy theories are more likely to be accepting of everyday crime, while exposure to theories increases a feeling of anomie. An enemy, which in turn predicts increased future everyday crime intentions. You liar. You barefaced liar, Dr. Dan Jolly of Staffordshire University. Get back into your safe little environment and brainwash the terminally brainwashed. But don't come out into the public ever again. <laughs> the study entitled Belief in Conspiracy Theories and Intentions to Engage in Everyday Crime and published in the British Journal of Social Psychology, was performed in two parts with two separate groups. Basically, then they go into the fact that they think that narcissism and self-esteem levels have a large impact on persons' belief in conspiracy theories. The results showed that people who rated highly on the narcissism scale and who had low self-esteem were more likely to be conspiracy believers. I mean, they're just taking it up to a ridiculous level now. There are narcissists in all walks of life and there are people who have low self-esteem in all forms of life. Now, having lowest self-esteem can be quite a good thing because it can actually make you see things outside yourself rather than through yourself. And that's something that maybe they should have thought of and addressed. But uh, they're just going for sound bites. They're a bunch of mentally lazy and enfeebled psychology people working in a very narrow field. <clears throat> However, they say, while low self-esteem, narcissism and belief in conspiracies are strongly linked, it's not clear that one or a combination cause the other. Let's just... So, in other words, what they do, they make a load of rubbish up, and at the end, they give themselves a get-out clause. In other words, um, it's not clear that one or a combination causes the other. So, nar having low self-esteem, narcissism and believing in conspiracies... They say strongly linked, but on the other hand, they say that there's no evidence for it. So, but this Dr. Jolly, if you're looking up Dr. Dan Jolly, somebody put underneath in the comments that he's actually working in some way for basically intelligence services. Just look him up. It's quite interesting. He works for some organization within intelligence services also. So this is just like the narrative that you get out of Demos again which is just an arm of MI5, the usual crap that comes out of hope, not hate, which is basically, as we said earlier, the pound shop version of the Southern Poverty Law Centre in America, who actually have to scrounge money off the public to sue people rather than do it themselves. Whereas the Southern Poverty Law Centre, I've got 430 odd million in store just to just to cause controversy. Yeah. But um, yeah, if you see the bigger picture, you're less likely to focus on trivial, cr trivial crime. Now, Basically, this is interesting. Yeah, Dr. Jolly and his colleagues, it says here in the comments section, work in a branch of research commissioned by the UK intelligence agency's CREST, Centre for Research and Evidence on Security Threats. Well, basically, that's the MI5 narrative, isn't it? That means that, oh, basically, yeah, look out for the far right, you know, the non-existent far right, which was, it was non-existent pretty much in this country before they started putting it everywhere and labelling everyone who voted Brexit as far right. So this this subversive psychologist is um, basically in amongst these people in the security services. It says this Crest Centre for Research and Evidence on Security Threats, launched in 2015, focuses on behavioural and social science to counter and mitigate threats. Oh yeah, well maybe he's got something to do with 7-7 Brigade, which got hacked the other week. You know, the people in the British Army were controlling the narrative on social media through the Psychological Operations Group. So this guy is basically... He's a Stasi subversive. He says this particular research speculates a link between conspiracy theories and crime, but used very small groups and the findings are controversial. Well, they're controversial because there's no proof of them, not least because it seems to stigmatise a very large number of decent people who have reasonable suspicions about the way mainstream media reports or selectively ignores world events. Very good comments on this, actually. Um, Another commenter said, I was at Kent 20 odd years ago. This is Kent University. The leftist idiots were coming into lectures on completely unrelated subjects and spewing their rhetoric. Even in those days, nothing changes. They have the life experience of a walnut and I wouldn't trust a single one of them. So many universities are totally discredited these days. Kent has dropped down the league tables very fast since those days. I wonder why. So this is another comment from the Looney Lander. He says... 
Conspiracy theorist. A straw man identity created by the CIA to demonise anyone who questions the establishment's official account of things. That's a wonderful idea, someone else said, to call for the Israeli regime to investigate itself. Impartiality is guaranteed. Very interesting comments underneath that. Nothing really in favour of it, so most of the public can see through it. And some of those comments are really, really good talking about the conspiracy theorists being the creation of the CIA. I wonder why these people who wrote this garbage don't know this stuff, or maybe they do. Now, let's get on to this. The UK is to fine Facebook and Google up to 4% value for not removing hate speech and fake news fast enough. Well, this is interesting, actually, because... When I post anything, one of our shows on Facebook, it gets very little traction. However, on the Spreaker platform, which I would recommend anyone actually subscribing to, please do, please subscribe to us on Spreaker, because that's what we go out on, and listen to us on Spreaker. It's on the Windows on the World live page. I upload them to the front page of the Windows on the World, usually a day or two later, but go to the live pages, and, and the whole archive is there the archive of all the windows on the world stuff we've done as a radio show is all there and do go to our archive which is still being looked at on of course youtube and bit shoot which we prefer people to go to but our videos are still getting an enormous amount of views on there and loads of comments every day as are our radio shows so that's great and it means that the likes of twitter and facebook and all the rest of it don't really affect us that much because we have now our own audience so thank you for being our audience. That's something that I really appreciate. But anyway, let's get back to this. UK to find Facebook and Google up to 4% for not removing hate speech and fake news fast enough. Hate speech and fake news in inverted commas, of course. He says the UK is rolling out a draconian new harmful content policy that will punish social media with massive fines if they fail to remove ill-defined hate speech, misinformation and problematic content quickly enough. Tech executives could actually face criminal penalties if they are unable to rein in malicious use of their platforms, according to Culture Secretary Jeremy Wright, who joined James on a jaunt to Silicon Valley, this is the guy who wrote the thing, and earlier this month to meet with Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg and hammer out the details of the regulation. So it says the UK is rolling out a draconian new harmful content policy that will punish social media with massive fines if they fail to remove ill-defined hate speech, misinformation and problematic content quickly enough. So there you go. Those are more reasons to stop using Facebook. Now, Facebook I find quite useful in some ways because when I do see these news feeds of people, there's often some really interesting stories and local stories in there as well. So it's almost like a news magazine. That's all I use it for. But I know that our stuff doesn't get seen on there. And I've been told that by several contributors to the shows. But it says here, an independent tech regulator would have the power to impose fines, yeah, amounting to as much as 4% of a company's value. Um, if they're too slow in removing objectionable content. And that was according to UK Digital Minister Margot James. That's what we're talking about, the James, Margot James, UK Digital Minister. Now, who are these people? You know, I mean, when you look them up, they are just in the pockets of every globalist implementation going. Um, It's told... Business Insider, the new rules would be officially unveiled next month. The regulations are purportedly aimed at eradicating illegal hate speech. Okay, who's going to define that then? Along with child grooming and problematic content. Okay, they've put that in related to suicide and self-harm, but also to target the Western government's beloved punchbag misinformation, it says here. While the new regulator is supposed to be independent of government, oh yeah, Well, it's an extension of government, isn't it? It will be up to ministers to decide whether to set up a brand new body or just hand the responsibility for censoring objectionable content over to Ofcom. Ofcom are basically a mafia. Ofcom are really problematic because they're now going after people on the back of hearsay. We've heard this about local radio stations. Now, local radio stations are being absorbed by these mu- these multinational global thing- corporations, like Global Radio, you know, the one that owns LBC Heart Radio, all this. They're, they're going to start implementing having these local radio stations that are generic. So it's not a local radio station. It's basically just a narrow content provider. That's all they're going to be. 
So that's the future of all this stuff and everything's getting taken down or anything decent that's local is being starved and kicked out. So it's very important now that people actually contribute through platforms like, say, Windows on the World and all the other uh, media that we can get out there and all of the people who put this stuff out on a regular basis to keep doing it and and basically just to create their own audiences, which I think has happened. And that's what all this is about, of course. But it says, based in part on Germany's Nets DG laws, which fine companies tens of millions of dollars for hate speech if offending messages are not deleted within a certain period, the new UK regulations won't stop at censoring illegal hate speech, which uh, apparently defines this, this minister defines as anything from terrorist recruitment, this Margot James uh, videos, to racism, leaving plenty of wiggle room there for neocon think tanks to sink popular alternative media pages. So that's an aside and a very true one. But basically, it says the report decried malign forces spreading disruption and confusion, liberally sprinkling the, sprinkling the descriptor Russian throughout in case there was any doubt what flavor of discord was being sowed of course the institute for strategic dialogue and their lobbying group which goes round basically attacking people on twitter and saying that they're all russians and attacking so-called russian disinformation so there you go um this margaret james admits it isn't social media's fault that to- oh that's good of her isn't it that toxic content is posted on their platforms, but insists you've got to take it down before it proliferates. She was open about her desire to impose the model on other governments, lamenting that the US government does not ban hate speech, but expressing hope that the UK model could be a template, ensuring other governments follow our lead. Change agent talk there from Margot James, another useful idiot. Facebook whistleblower, it says here, reveals... Routine suppression of conservative content. Well, by conservative, I think you just mean anybody that's moderate, don't you? That's what we were talking about at the beginning of the show. Um, you know, everyone's extreme right, aren't they, now, if they voted Brexit or they don't believe in climate change and they don't go along with Extinction Rebellion and, and the childlike belief in global warming through a 15-year-old with Asperger's. So, yeah, you're a Nazi if you don't believe that, aren't you? The employee who left Facebook, this is the whistleblower in 2018, was later hired by Project Veritas, along with screenshots from a Facebook workstation. It says, show the specific technical actions taken against political figures, as well as existing strategies taken to combat political speech, according to Veritas, such as deboosting, by which the visibility of certain content is reduced algorithmically based on certain keywords. Also notable, the Facebook Insider says that the deboost action does not notify page owners that their content has been subject to the algorithm, saying with these deboost live stream things there was no warning sent to the user. These were actions that were being taken without the users knowing. Now this is what I think has been going on for ages because I've had no traction on Facebook at all. And even though people find me, I'm called Mark Alexander Scott on there because they wouldn't even let me call myself Mark Windows because Mark Windows was my original Facebook page name. Now, someone's gone to Facebook and said, I don't think it's his real name. Now, there's so many people on there with daft names. It's 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 kind of a bit strange that they picked on me after all that time to take down and say I couldn't use Mark Windows. Now, even when... I've got my birth name and my nickname is Mark Windows and that's actually underneath it. I still can't change this name that I put in that I thought I'd be able to change. So this odd things going on with Facebook and Twitter with the Windows on the World stuff because I'm finding that people are telling me that they can't see what I'm putting up there. So yes, shadow banning. We did talk about that a while ago, but it says here, These were actions that were being taken without the users knowing, you know. The insider did not notice the deboost tag on any left-wing pages, it says. Facebook, or an individual at Facebook, has the unilateral power to create false allegations against someone he or she doesn't like. Now, this goes into what happened on Twitter. This goes to what happened on Wikipedia. I had someone slander me on Wikipedia, couldn't get it taken down, 
When I asked who was in their legal department, they said, don't bother, you won't get anywhere. This was like reading page 22 of the Hasbro handbook. They were arrogant, they were unprofessional, and they were very petty-minded, trivial people, in my opinion. The ones that I actually screenshotted who were responding to my complaint that I couldn't actually change content about myself on Wikipedia and even update things on Wikipedia, which as I was kind of doodling around one evening, it wasn't something I was particularly serious about, but I thought I'll change this, I'll change that, that bit's not right, I'll put my name in there and I'll maybe put something about Windows on the World, always, always deleted in real time. Funnily enough, the same as when we tried to update the Momentum page, of course, Momentum, run by John Landsman. See our report, Momentum and Labour Zionism, and you'll find out all about Momentum and how it's owned, what it's about, and what its agenda is. And no, it's nothing to do with helping Jeremy Corbyn. It's to do with keeping him under control. And we were changing some of the information which we'd got from Companies House about John Landsman's companies and how they run momentum and it was being deleted in real time it was being deleted in real time can you believe that that they've got these people working on it and aware all day long they're on it but it says um carries on here the person accused not only can't do anything about the allegation they don't even have an idea the allegation was made mike chernovich said good point that is um, after deplatforming, says Per in Sweden, we've now got deboosting to add to our new totalitarian vocabulary. Yes, indeed, we have. Um, yes, every last vestige of the notion of fair play has been eliminated. It carries on, though. Transparency Group Project Veritas has exposed what it claims is a series of tools used by Facebook to target conservative pages and restrict their content without warning. They include classing posts as hate speech, limiting live streams and su suppressing the reach of posts. Now, one of our contributors, Francis Leader, I think she's on a, still on a month's Facebook ban, actually. And, and she's the one who told me that a lot of my stuff and the windows on the world and even a lot of stuff that she was posting was getting flagged and actually visibly flagged. So, yeah, really interesting stuff there and good reasons to be suspicious and keep out of social media because what they're trying to do also is ban vaccination groups on Facebook. I mean, th there's actually a woman who's trying to do it, a lobbyist who's trying to do it. We might, might do something on that next week, actually, because it's absolutely outrageous, these people imposing their opinions on the public. And that's all they are, opinions. They've only got opinions about vaccination. They don't really know anything about it. So they're saying, we want everyone vaccinated. And other people are saying, well, we don't want it. Oh, well, you can't say that. That's not part of the new totalitarian regime. That's not part of population reduction. That's not being a good citizen. That's not saying two and two is five. What's the matter with you? <laughs> Let's just get on to police violence now against the Gilets Jaunes in France, the Yellow Vests. It said it sparked a broad backlash. Backlash. This is by Oliver Haynes. Riot police using flashballs and rubber bullets in France have caused severe harm. Well, no kidding. Now our movement is growing to disarm them. Jacques Pezet, fact-checking journalist for the Czech News Division of Liberation, had, as of the 30th of January, counted 144 verifiable cases of Gilets jaunes and journalists severely injured by the riot police. At least 14 victims have lost an eye, and 92 of the 144 have been shot by flashballs. And these flashballs, as we have reported, are rubber bullets fired from a tube-like weapon with the stopping power of a 38 caliber handgun. And at close range, as the French CRS riot police have used them, they can be particularly damaging. Now, this is quite interesting because it goes on to say that these people who are actually... Uh, being employed to shoot the general public are basically people who are trained to go after hardened criminals and so they shouldn't really be doing it i mean these are trained marksmen so why are they shooting people in the head and in the face and blowing their eyes out They're, these people are psychopaths or there's something wrong with them to do that so i think it's really important that this is reported dufresne it says here has become tireless in his documentation. This is David Dufresne, he's a journalist and documentary maker who focuses on police violence. 
Um, he's, he's, he says it's been tireless in his documentation of police violence and has become one of the most authoritative voices on the issue. Every week he finds and compiles lists of the injuries of these people, tweeting them out and assiduously tagging the Twitter account of France's Interior Ministry. Good for him, which both acts as a signal boost for victims' complaints and reinforces the viewpoint that both he and DL share that this violence must be understood as orchestrated by the state rather than just rogue police state actors. Now, that is a really good place to end this section and this show, actually. This violence must be understood as orchestrated by the state. So, yes, I think that is actually the main point we're trying to make tonight. The lobbyists and puppets and the people who are being orchestrated by the state need to be held more accountable by the public. Let's use social media to do that before we all get banned. So that's it for tonight. Our talks, the bigger picture, are resuming in April with myself, Piers Corbyn and Sandy Adams. We have one on 13th of April in Thlandilo. Our friend down there has organised us at the Angel Inn in Thlandilo. Um, that's in Wales. Look it up. I'll be putting it on the website soon. But to give you a bit more information about The Bigger Picture, I'm going to play you our little trailer. The Bigger Picture, an amazing series of talks featuring Piers Corbin, Mark Windows and Sandy Adams, bringing you the most important information you've probably never heard. There is a bigger picture going on behind the repetitive mantras of change, regeneration, diversity, vibrant communities and sustainability. And they've gone through a plan which is the same on all of them. Countries weren't taking this on. They just weren't. It was too much trouble. And something happened at the Johannesburg Conference in 2002. The corridor of power and control, decoded and explained. The point is a lot of these operatives don't know about Agenda 21. They just, oh... That's what that council did, and this is what the Association of London Authority says we ought to do, so let's do it. And they, the community, you just close down uh, day centres, close down playgroups, um, create traffic problems, okay, and uh, destroy meeting places. Aylesbury Estate, the first thing they did once they decided to demolish was knock down the community centre in the middle. I mean, I used to belong to the Ecology Party years ago, and that was real environmentalism. This has been hijacked. It's a Trojan horse. They want to treble housing density and put flats for sale where not a single tenant on the flats in Danbury Avenue overlooking the park is allowed to return to a flat in Danbury Avenue overlooking the park. Not one. Well, there you are. That's what the Club of Rome actually put in this report. It was their plan to to make humanity have a common enemy. They thought global warming would fit the bill. Labour, Conservative, Green, Liberal, it doesn't really matter because none of them are going to address the main issue of what this is about because they can't, because it's above them. Did you know that in 2018, 64% of populations in so-called democracies state their governments rarely or never act in the public interest? Lie one, lie two. There you go. Lie one would be atheism. Lie two is organised religion. Okay, so let's have the extreme left and the the invented far right. UK think tank, Demos. The new democracy will work with a combination of government open infiltration and citizen groups taking direct action. Change agents, change agents breaking down. You know, oh, 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 oh no. I've got to go on another course after this. Where there's a problem, there's a solution. Because it means that anyone who gets one of those forms does not have to sign it. And they've stopped it now, right? They've given them back to the council. So that affected hundreds of thousands of people. If you engage with this stuff and learn a bit of it, it's remarkable what you can do. And I'm going to give you some more examples of that as we go along. Global elite's aim is nothing less than to create a world system of financial control in private hands, able to dominate the political system of each country and the economy of the world as a whole. The system was to control in a feudalistic fashion by the central banks of the world acting in concert through frequent conferences and private meetings. Carol Quigley, Tragedy and Hope, 1966. To book our talks on the bigger picture, Contact us at info at windowsontheworld.net.
Join me, Mark Windows, for Windows on the World Live every Sunday, 9 to 11 p.m. GMT. Check out our archive and program stream at windowsontheworld.net.